Who's going to do it? Leave it. Care for it's all yours. We're live. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, recorder. Start the recorder. Recorder's recording. Nobody is yet watching. Kev's on mute. Uh, yeah, he's on that way. I was on mute. <laughs> no, I told you, mate. I told you. <laughs> you mute. We need you on more often. You can sort out all our problems, Matty. <laughs> oh, here they come. <laughs> here they come. Here they, here they, they come. come. Here, here they, they come. come. Welcome right. to Knife Making Down Under Podcast, Pubcast, another Thursday night with the three best people in Australia. <laughs> this time of night, we have Mert Tansu from Tansu Knives. Corin Urquhart from Gamaco and Artisan Supplies, me, Kev's Forge, and our illustrious, esteemed guest for this oh, evening. Like illustrious. <laughs> yeah. Matt Mewburn, Matty Mewburn from Everly Works. G'day, guys. Lovely to be on. <laughs> We're happy that you lie. That is all good. <laughs> There's plenty more to come. Fear not. I've got them stored up. <laughs> oh yeah, we've spent a fair amount of time with you, mate. We know what's coming. <laughs> I do really like. I've never been on this end. I've, I do like the streaming comments across the bottom. It's very professional. Corin, you should pull oh, up yeah. Tim Forge comments and fire. Corin, Corin gets. <laughs> He's Corin so gets fired. <laughs> The, the time that Corin came down here and we, we sat up in my workshop mm. and I got I got access to the control panel, I was like, oh, man, I can bring up these comments. And we, <laughs> only Corin has that accent. He, he hasn't given uh, us, Mert and I, the privileges yet, the right the full to do stream. so. Yeah. I don't know how. You've got to earn trust. You don't know That's how. What about. No. You don't know how or you do know how. Corin can't fire me. I'm still at the office. I'm never leaving. Hmm. Is that I was actually, I just <laughs> I was actually talking to Tim about, I don't know, maybe an hour ago, and he sent me a screen dump, a photo of him, and he's at work. And I'm like, what Look the at hell this are Scott you doing? Corin, you're a dual citizen of Australia and New Zealand. Did you have to have sex with both, both a sheep and a kangaroo? Now, let me tell you something, young man. I've already explained this to you. Kangaroos are too fast. They're not as easy as sheep. Now, you know, and, and, and it's very important to remember, you guys don't have to. You choose to. It's very different. Oh, yeah. It's a choice. <laughs> G'day, Doug. How are you going? <laughs> oh, so the caliber of knife making <laughs> down under podcast just... We, we started on the peak, peak didn't we? We've really we, started high. Yeah. We can either keep going strong or we'll just falter. <laughs> Rob Fraser's fun, jumped man. in with a you're slumming it, aren't you? And I, I feel like after that intro, maybe he's right. <laughs> yeah. um, well, have we had an intro? We, we did, I did an intro. No, the intro oh, was sorry. magnificent. It was the sh the sheep, the intercourse after that that really got yeah, me hazed. the sheep intercourse conversation <laughs> afterwards that... Already brought us down. Bloody Gregan into the gutter. Look at him go. Oh, yes. We have a little announcement there. Oh, <laughs> Corin let that on the screen for a very small amount of time. <laughs> it is Corin's birthday. We all saw it. <laughs> yeah, we all <laughs> saw it. Do we have to do a sing song? I'd love a sing song. I think yeah, Bert should lead us on a sing song. <laughs> yeah, he will later on tonight. One of his special. Yeah. Do I get Genius. do I get a happy birthday, Mr. President, or or Mr. Yeah. Treasurer, or whatever? Yeah, you'll get a happy birthday, what? Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Magnificent, yeah. Mr. President. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, right. let's get. Sorry, to the, I've got to go somewhere. somewhere. Okay. <laughs> yes. So We've for everyone that's on. just everyone that's just started to join in, seventy is a good number. We're happy with that. Uh, everyone that's yeah. just joining us. Um, see a lot of our regular names on there. Glad to see you guys back on board for yet another couple of 60th. hours of putting up with us. Uh, all Happy good. 60th. I don't think Corin's 60th. He just looks 60. Yeah. <laughs> and Mert's frozen in the coolest looking face. <laughs> <laughs> He's not frozen. There's a birthday. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an extended birthday kiss there for you, Corin. Just to up your... Up to your computer screen. 
<laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm flattered, Mert. I'm flattered. I, hey, he's putting in the, about the same amount of effort that he put in last week. He's a he truly a beautiful this, man. He failed to show up. <laughs> yeah, after telling us he was all prepared. Oh, no. It was, it was quite bad. There was a language barrier, but I don't think it had anything to do with the fact that he speaks Turkish and we don't. <laughs> Jeff? Jeff? <laughs> oh, <laughs> fuck you, Jeff. We, we can't <laughs> see him, but we can hear him. <laughs> oh, sorry, Mert. Uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't me talking then. It, someone took over my microphone. Oh, that's oh. enough bullshit. We've got Matty. Yeah, Maddie. so for everyone that's just joined in uh, and is on the live feed, you will see that we have an extra person on deck tonight, and it's Matt Mewburn uh, from Everly Works up in Sydney. And for those who are joining us or listening in on through the podcast, um, Matt Mewburn is with us. So we're going to uh, dive straight into the deep end with Matt Woo. and start, first of all, uh, asking some questions. First first question I want to pop up to you, mate, is how good Fuck, is I just figured back? out something new. Kev, Kev, I just oh. figured out something new. Check it out. What's that? Check that out. Whoa. I got him on the screen all big like. Whoa. Whoa, he's, he's on big screen. Like. That's awesome. <laughs> no, let's fuck Blair off just a minute. There we go. <laughs> uh, just to see the shirt I'm repping. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. a rad shirt. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't do I that. can't, I can't turn around because I've got a yeah. wrong burgundy. I'm not wearing any pants, so if I try and turn around. <laughs> <laughs> see, wait, wait till you see the comments. Wait till you see the comments. <laughs> wait, how oh, many wait. how many distorted mofos want to see it? Hey, We've so just jumped up wait. to 140 <laughs> viewers. Third, 37 viewers have just jumped in through Grinder. Just Twitch stream. <laughs> you, just, you just put the Australia thing on my face card. <laughs> the uh, the, the oh, you. What? That's all right, man. He's frozen again, anyway. So, <laughs> I was going to say. You have to put there your he... head to the side, mate. <laughs> <He's> the... <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a visual. There it's a go. visual thing sometimes with it's this podcast. I'll, just sit. I'll yeah. move my chair over. Look, you feel better now, you dumb fuck. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right. Look. The guys don't even know what we're talking about unless they're watching no, live. So we'll let's rock and roll. Time, that doesn't matter. But, <laughs> I was going to uh, ask, Matty, good. how does it how does it feel to finally be back at with Everly Works open, mate? Oh, mate. Yeah, look, it's. I, I know a lot of people would think a huge extended vacation would be just the treat, but um, it couldn't have come at a worse time or a better time. Really, we we'd scheduled. We scheduled a bit of a shutdown because we were going to do some renos. Mervac are doing renos around the park at South Everly there. Everyone sort of knows about. But And so we thought, great, you know, we'll take a couple of months off. We'll get the floors redone. We'll get the electrics redone. Beautiful. And then COVID came along. And so all of a sudden I had all of this free time that I've, I'm not really used to having. And I didn't have anywhere to go. Couldn't do anything with it. Couldn't travel. Couldn't go. It was I'd, – I'd sort of planned – we had a trip to the States. There was a really great um, – the California Blacksmiths Association had a really great meetup that was scheduled for early this year, which got binned. Um, James and I were going to fly over to that. There was just a whole bunch of stuff that was planned that really revolved around not being stuck at home. So it is not only a relief to be back at work, but it's actually it's a, it's been very enjoyable. Um, I don't know if you guys get the same feeling, but I, there's, there's a, an immense satisfaction being able to just set everything up the way you like get all of your tools laid out, pick them apart, you know, get them up on the racks. We've spent a ton of time building shelving and racks and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that stuff's been – like, I've loved being back, mate. It's been awesome. Yeah, awesome. Because we'll let Kyron talk about his little weekend escape to Everly Works, but he was telling me about, like, even just a simple thing – well, not a simple thing, a thing like <laughs> getting your floors redone. That's a monumental task. Yeah, yeah. Like so if, if the viewers, most of the viewers, I'm sure, or well, listeners, listeners and viewers, I'm sure most of them have either been to or seen Everly Works. And the first thing, apart from the massive power hammers that came into my mind when Corin was like, "Oh, they've got new concreted floors at level," was like, <laughs> just your just the steel rack. 
Yeah, yeah. So it all wow. got lifted. Literally everything got moved. There's 1,500 square meters of blacksmithing, all of the stock, all of the tools. Um, the only stuff that didn't come out was the really heavy plant. So the things like the upsetting machines, the power hammers that are sitting on a slab, you know, that stuff didn't have to move because they're already on isolated slabs. But every sundry item moved and everything that would move moved. We we probably shifted 20 tons on the steel rack alone. Um with, and there was the alloy steel rack as well, which probably had another eight or ten on it. Um, and that the all of the dies, you know, we moved. I think it was close to thirty or forty boxes. When I say boxes, they were pallet-sized crates that were made up. Um, yeah. they, they and some of those were three and four tons a piece, and they were all just all the dies for the Ajax machine and the Kovmac machine, which were lumped in there. Everything that could be lifted, myth. The, the question on everyone's lips, though, is: Did, did you find the dies for the railway spikes, Matt? Oh, you'd be, you'd be. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I, <laughs> I don't know if I need to perpetuate this. Uh, neither, I cannot confirm nor deny that I may. Um, <laughs> there, there may be some uh, fifty-one sixty railway spikes that I dug up somewhere. Some bridge spikes, some rare corner bridge spikes. Yes, that's um, right. Bridge curve spikes. Yep, curve bridge, the illustrious bridge curve spike. Um, mate, I've got the, I'm not even going to talk about it. We'll talk for a moment. moment. Right. For a moment, though, when you were talking about stuff there, I thought you I thought you'd got married through this COVID disappearance of Matty Mewburn because you mentioned <laughs> the ups because you mentioned the upsetting machine, and I mean <laughs> we've all got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> My wife doesn't listen to this, and if she does, I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> You're in all sorts. Yeah. Look, sometimes it's joyous to to run the upsetting machine for hours and hours on end. You know, so mm. once or twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> Birthdays and Christmas. <laughs> Hers are yours. And yet, and yet here I am recording here instead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, it was it was, a, it was mammoth. It was a mammoth move. It was, yeah, like the logistics. I never logistics, want to do it again. Like the logistics involved in that, it, it boggles my mind. Like how, like I look at my workshop, and I, I've had a few weeks off, or you know, fuck, a few weeks, nearly two months off now with my dodgy back, and I've just been shifting stuff slowly and surely. And now my back's a bit better. I've been getting into moving stuff around, <clears throat> not doing anything stupid, but. My fucking tiny little workshop causes me enough grief, and that's again when I think about just how massive a task that would have been for you guys. So let's let's just step back a bit though, because we're talking about massive tasks. We're talking about you know how big a job it was, but we got listeners from all over the world, and they haven't got a fucking clue who Matt is, right? And that would be a <laughs> shame. Look him up, Matty Newburn, good guy, but. Let's talk. Let's get into the into the actual what Everly Works is. Like I'm sure some of our listeners might be aware, like our live guys, but the podcasters they're not going to have a clue. So, Maddie, tell us about Everly Works. Tell us about we've advertised this on Facebook as being the best workshop in Australia. Yeah, well, at least the best accessible one for sure. I, I think um, so. What? What Everly was as a precinct was that was the the core of the New South Wales Rail Network essentially. So there was they were it was built in 1887 or it was commissioned and finished in 1887. Um, they started building steam locos. They started assembling steam locos and then they started actually building them themselves there. Um, and then when that fell out of fashion, they were building diesels on site. But basically, it's it's a it, it's a giant train workshop, um, and it was. A much larger precinct so they had an on-site foundry they had the carriage works which has become quite famous as a precinct for art and culture um that's all part of the everly compound there but the the shop that we're occupying at the moment is phase one and two was the original blacksmith shop so some of the oldest parts of the the whole precinct um and what what was really great about south everly or, you know the everly the whole everly place was it was back in those days it was completely integrated you know you didn't you weren't waiting for parts to come from overseas. You weren't waiting on the fella down the road to finish the machining. You know, like they they cast their own raw castings on site and they dragged them up and they they forged components 
to integrate with them and they took them to machine shops and they they were able to with these monstrous planers and boring machines these beautiful big english machines they were literally breaking down tons and tons worth of steel to to make these locos so that was what it started out as that that all came to a grinding halt in in the late 80s um the railway workshop shut down and it sort of languished for a bit and then it, it came into private hands so you guys would all be familiar but the guys that aren't um guido and his wife partner wendy pardon me uh they took the place on and they were there for you know 20 25 years and um yeah so it's been in private hands for that that period of time <clears throat> i grabbed it about five years ago um and now it's it's a it's sort of multifaceted. We started out just running blacksmithing classes because we thought, well, this place is incredible. That you guys have been there, but you you walk in and it's just got so much history. It's steeped in it. You know, you you can smell. It just smells like a workshop. It, it everything is in the original context that it was supposed to be in. And you know, a lot of those tools there were made by the blacksmiths that worked there, and and some of them might be a hundred years old. Um, so you're working there. You're working in there, and it was just it's it's too immense not to share you know that feeling is is too much not to want to share with people so the best way we thought to do that was to run classes um so that that started off as i said that was about five years ago we started running the classes and um they were really successful you know people really loved it and we we've we've got got some really great guys on board that, are, that they just love what they're doing they love sharing it um and off the back of that you know i've i've been able to get back to the stuff that i love to do as well which is actually making commissions and you know, doing the doing the jobs not just teaching them so yeah the last couple of years we've gotten back into the making doing as big a jobs as we can take on i guess um i love the big stuff i just love the challenge of uh looking at something and going shit i'm not really sure how i'm going to figure this out but uh that process is kind of what i really really drives me to come in so yeah that's that's a little bit about what we're doing and uh you know the blacksmith shop like i was saying before it's fairly well except for the floors it just got replaced but they were replacing a floor that wasn't original as well uh just about everything's in the original context you know you walk in there and the machinery it's it's all old english machinery some of it's old american machinery um but it was installed through the through the railway days and the shop was very <clears> dynamic <throat> you know, even though the big hammers and stuff and the big davy press big 1500 ton davy press um they're kind of the most famous members of the the big iron monoliths that occupy bay one the, the big heavy forging stuff it was pretty dynamic there was a lot of machinery changing and, and chopped around and moved so you know to kind of be on the next generation of that and and to be able to take the shop in an, another direction again is yeah it's kind of what we're about doing hey matt yeah how did yeah. how did a young fella like you five years ago took over the one of the biggest blacksmithing shops in Australia <laughs> and on New South Wales. How did that happen? How did I you get it, Matty? I wonder that all the time. Um, yeah. So it was actually, you know what this came off the back of was a symposium down at Keith's place. Um, that's where I trace it back to because, uh, so the fellow it's Guido. All Uncle, it's all Uncle Keith's fault. It's a yeah, bloody <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, of course way. it is. And then as, as means for payback, we brought him in to teach knife making classes for a couple of years there just to really, you know, put the thumb back down. Um, yeah, so we, I was at a, a symposium. I don't know. This might have been like 2014, I think it would have been, 2014, 2015, down at Keith's place in Tamil, Keith Flutter's place. And um, Bruce and I were making we were doing a, a wrapped and welded axe in the evening. So we'd, we'd finished the seminars for the day and yeah, we were doing, um, doing this wrapped and welded axe. And I didn't really know who he was, but Guido was there who was the, he was the current occupier at that time of the workshop and had been there for, like I said, he'd been there for 20 odd years. Um, and he sort of saw us doing our thing and thought, Oh, you know, this young guy looks like he might be, might be good to get involved. And he approached me, maybe a week later after the symposium sort of cold called and just said hey matt i i saw you at the symposium you know do you want to come down and do some teaching for me at the at the workshop and i'd never visited the workshop this is the really stupid thing i'd been to the first knife show there that that was held i not sorry not the very very first knife show but the the everly knife show back whenever it was and even then because i was manning a table i didn't get into the blacksmith shop to check <clears> it out <throat> 
going, oh, shit, there's this amazing workshop next door, amazing, amazing, amazing. But by the time I went to Sticky Beak, it had been closed up and there was not much I could do about it. So, yeah, I got this cold call from, from Guido and he said, oh, look, you know, do you want to come in and do some teaching? So we did that um, and I spent maybe, I don't know, it would have been three or four months, I guess, that we that I was hanging out with him and, and taking classes here and there and just actually playing around. It was, a, it was actually a really fun time because I was running a much smaller blacksmith shop over in uh, Alexandria so it was just around the corner. So he'd finish work at four o'clock or whatever and he'd ring me up and go, hey, mate, I've got the big furnaces on. I want to knock down this billet. And we were making these monster Damascus billets. Like I'm talking about 15 kilo billets. You know, they were bloody three or four hundred <laughs> long, huge bastards. And yeah. so we'd walk in there and anyone that's been to the shop seen the big oil furnace running. But, you know, it is, it's very moody. When you walk in there at five o'clock at night in the winter, it's pretty black. You've got the... F- the fire, the big oil furnace is throwing all sorts of weird shadows in every which direction. All the tools on the walls are casting yeah. these weird shadows. So it's really like walking onto the set of a movie. And um, so, yeah, I'd just show up after work and he'd stay back after work and we'd just dick around just making all this weird stuff and wonderful stuff. I think at the time we were trying to make a massive billet so that he could machine a, a block plane or something out of it. I can't, can't quite remember what it was for, but... That was that was the start of it. Um, so yeah, we I started working with him, and we got a relationship, and um, yeah, we were just having fun, just having a really fun. Like Corin and I were on the weekend, just dicking around blacksmithing the way that we all do. Um, and yeah, and then he sort of said to me one day, about six months later, he said, "Look, you know, we're we're leaving town. We've we've had it with Sydney, had it with blacksmithing. Shit, you know, what do you think? Do you want to go for this lease?" And I on you would think that that would be a decision that you just go oh fuck yeah of course I will, but I was pretty scared about it. I, I thought you know it's a big lease. There's a lot of lot of it's a lot of rent to pay compared to what I was paying before. You know you get nervous about whether you can make it work or whether it's you know if, are you going to send yourself <laughs> around doing it. Um, and then I, I so I just kind of went home and I went you know what I don't have all that much to lose, and you'll never get offered a place like that second time. You know. So just jumped on it. Uh, we, I was really lucky to get in with, some, with two other good guys. Uh, one of them was actually his, his daughter, Kat, and uh, her, her partner at the time, Louis. Um, and they're both still friends of mine. I you know, love them both. Uh, so we started the business together. Um, and, yeah, those early days, though, I, I've blocked it out, to be honest. It was a lot like what we just went through. When we first moved in, it, just, it had been set up for manufacturing and doing a lot of different stuff in, in steel not so much the blacksmithing focus that we wanted. So the first six months were just, were setting up, you know, moving dies, rearranging everything, trying to organize it in a more ergonomic way. And yeah, so that was the first six months of being in there. And then after that, it's sort of the, 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 the classes have taken off and been really successful and bloody hell, it's a pleasure to go to work. <laughs> yeah. And as you were saying though, like when you say, oh yeah, the first six months were moving dies and stuff around, the, the most people in a home workshop go, oh, yeah, moving a few dies around, no worries. If you've been to Everly and you understand, like, just the the dies running down one of those walls. There's a wall of dies, like, yeah. The rack of dies, the rack of tongs, the, the, the squaring dies that you guys are using when Corin was there, and we'll let him talk about that. The, what do they weigh, like 40, 50 kilos for the die itself? Uh, the the big so Ajax. You spent six yeah. months moving around shit tons of fucking weight. <laughs> in, yeah, it's not grabbing a rack of tongs and walking around the corner. No, like that scope. No. It's hard for. I, well, it's, I I only know because I've been there a few times. But when the first, when people hear you going, oh, I spent six months moving dies around. They're like, "What? Well, you just keep going, fucking left and right, putting them up, picking them up, putting them down." Yeah. yeah uh, no. Monumental task. Everything's on a fucking massive scale. So I didn't realise at the time, though, when you're just stepping back in history there with that Everly um, knife show that we had, the first of the city yeah. knife shows there. I remember I recall. You were, I recall you, were... you being on that corner or near that corner <laughs> booth and you were selling, what was it, belts and some axes and a few other little bits and pieces. Oh, mate, I had all sorts of shit on that table. <laughs> yeah. And then my sister came past me because she was up there loitering with intent and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, and she's come over and she goes, oh, this, 
the guy over there selling the axe is a really interesting guy. She, I think she fucking talked everyone's ears off, though. So <laughs> her, she was going around sort of scoping all these people um, yeah. and then coming back. And, you know, I actually didn't realise until obviously just now that you didn't actually have – you weren't involved in Everly then. No, no shit, no. Yeah, that's, was, that's fucking – like, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So at that time, when the first knife show happened, I was – um. I was in a tiny workshop about the size of a two-car <laughs> garage out in Gladesville. And um, it, they were hard years. Like, I, I, I've, I've done You were running of, another business at that time as well, like yeah. was, before you went full-time. I was, yeah. I was in electronics then. Um, and it was, look, in hindsight, and we've all got great hindsight, um, I probably wasn't – I wasn't ready to put a – table together for a knife show at that point but i was like everything i've done i just went you know what yeah fuck it <laughs> oh what can what could happen you know if i, if I don't know, it might have been two or three hundred bucks for the table and i thought well and that's why it was furnished with other weird stuff because i i've been doing leather work for years before that and i loved it and i thought well it's a bit complimentary hopefully and i did sell a couple of belts and stuff um yeah it's it's complimentary and my knives weren't very good, so I needed something else to lift the quality of the table. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back let's go back even further than Everly and talk about, you know, basically where you grew up and how you got interested in, in knives and knife making and, and from that, well what came first, the blacksmith or the knife? Yeah. Um, it was really utilitarian. I grew up on a farm out in the southwest slopes out near um what would be the nearest town? Cowra, maybe, or Bora was the, oh, yeah. the town I went to school in, but no one knows where that Burrowa. is. Bora yeah, no, yeah. Burrowa. Burrowa. <laughs> Burrowa was great. Good town. Yeah. Probably awesome. known as Burrowa. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's where I went to school, and I, I was on a farm maybe 25 k's or so from, from there. Um, so all of all of my really earliest memories were metalwork-wise. It was – so the knives that we used were the, – the knives we used around the farm. So we used to kill a lot of our own – we, we had sheep predominantly, so we'd, we'd butcher sheep every couple of months. Um, and every now and then we'd, we'd have a bullock from, like my grandpa had an adjacent farm and he used to have some, he, he'd have some uh, beef on there. So that, they were the two kind of things that we ate every day. And to this day, I still don't really enjoy lamb. I had lamb, I reckon, every day for the first 10 years of my life. And I can't, I, I really struggle to get lamb in me now. Um and unlike uh, the guys from New Zealand who struggle to get in lamb, but anyway, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Gregan, but you know you had that come sorry. You started it. Don't be sorry. He, he, jar, that. Didn't he? He, yeah, he, he opened the jar of vaso. That's what he opened. The jar of. <laughs> well, it's a heartache. Um, yeah, so that's where it started off. It was, you know, we always had we had a knife in the car all the time. We had we had knives around. Like I, I've got a real, and I know that you three will also mirror this resentment, but the idea that a knife in any way would be scary is crazy to me. Because as a kid, they were everywhere, and they were, you know, they were accessible. And would you fancy it? Nothing stupid ever happened. You know, like they were tools, and they were to be respected, and um, that was kind of the ethos that I grew up with. So. I've I've kind of never even thought that much about knives in my early days because they were just so they were such a utility they were always around. Um, getting into metalwork again, I started pretty early. Like some some of my early earliest memories were building sheds and stuff like that on the property, and um, but actual blacksmithing probably didn't come until I was in high school. Maybe we did we did some blacksmithing in our D and T class, which I think most people my age didn't do, but. Um, yeah, that was that was really where I had my first taste, and I never would have considered it as a profession at that point. And I've, I think even now I still wonder how I got here. But I reckon, you know, like sitting there in a classroom doing a little bit of heat treatment, a little bit of forging on a um, on a center punch, it never occurred to me that blacksmithing was still something that you could pursue as a career. And I wish to God that I'd had more information about how how vast and diverse and broad this this community is with all the different ways you can you can go you know it's even within the subset of knife making the subset of blacksmithing that is knife making um there's so many different ways that controversial you can that. 
I'm, I'm sure Beamish is in there somewhere. So I, had to slip back <laughs> I haven't seen his name pop up yet, but yeah, he could <laughs> be. <laughs> Bound to. Don't worry. Um, yeah, I, I just I just wish earlier that I had have known because, like I said, I, I straight into this career of electronics accidentally, and you know all this other stuff has happened in between. And knowing now what I know and and loving the thing that I do as much as I do, I just wish that I'd been exposed to it earlier. Um, yeah, how about you guys? Where where I know a little bit about Corin's knife making background. Yeah, but... I wouldn't worry too much too much about us. We're interviewing you. You'll have to go back and oh, listen right. to the episode. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about us. We talk about us every week. That's funny though when you talk about. Matt, what are you drinking, by the way? Highland. Oh, this is a this Highland. is a Highland, Highland Park twelve year old. Yeah. Twelve year old. It's, I think this yeah. one was given to me by Pete Hill, another great touring blacksmith. Um, yeah, yeah nice. the twelve year old was quite nice. I'm drinking paint stripper. Yeah. Pete Hill, <laughs> Pete Hill, we took him bushwalking. I you lit did. a fire with rubbing sticks together. And he loved it immensely. He and his family had a great time up there. So did I. We, actually. Sh- that was- we showed him we showed him the sights, didn't we? That was good. It, it's funny, man. I was listening, having a little smile, a little internal laugh when you were saying about, you know, you know, we're used to knives. What what could possibly go wrong with knives? Why are they banned? And I just went <laughs> flashback to one of my many coastal trips when I was well. Old enough to have a license, probably not old enough to have a license, but I did. And my <laughs> mates and I used to get down the coast and we used to play this game where you'd, you'd be barefoot and you'd be drinking and you'd, <laughs> you'd throw the knife down towards the person's foot and you'd have to move your foot to where the knife landed. So you'd either make the person do the splits or make the person bring their feet right in. That's probably why knives are banned these days. Thanks, <laughs> probably. Thanks for that's probably for like, yeah. <laughs> Bulls so, drink, drinking like throbbing knives. What can go wrong? Oh, nothing. So, nothing went wrong except for a pulled groiny every now and then when you had to do a crazy splits maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about tell me about <laughs> knives and blacksmithing. Which one was it though that actually came first? Were you knife making there at Gladesville or blacksmithing? Uh, that was, look, it was knife making. I'll have to put my hand up. Um, so, I, the first how, so how did you get did, into knife making? Let's do this. I'll tell you, I'll tell you because Ooh, and, we're, and listening. Really we're listening. We're listening. I really wish I had the presence of mind to have bought it home because today, while I was I was fishing around for my tax file number, which is very exciting news, and Don't I, you know found, I'm I found a certificate that I got from Keith Flutter in 2013, um, <clears> because I'd done a I did a two-day knife making class with Keith down at his place in Tamor. And that was the first proper thing that I'd done. Like I I dicked around like everybody before that, just making messes and doing stupid stuff. But that was the first time that I'd probably really put a focus on making something that was half handsome. Um did so the, that was did this say congratulations, you survived two days with Keith. <laughs> you did <laughs> get nagged to death. <laughs> I think um I think I met you that. I think I met you that weekend. I think I came up. Keith said, "Oh, come up and meet this bloke." You did, and I think I, I did. Keith was no, running he, out of gas. He, That's why. No, he would have oh, said, right. Keith would ran have out said, of gas. Up, yeah, he would have said, "Bring up some gas, and you can meet this scrawny piece of shit that's up here doing a course." <laughs> <laughs> you did. No, I remember. You definitely did. Um, so yeah, that was that was the first real, real genuine piece of creative blacksmithing I did and it was a it was knife. Um I did, you know what, I've got to admit something else that embarrasses me to no end on that weekend. I so how many times have I know you guys <laughs> have all taught classes before. How many times have you had someone come in and go, oh fuck, you know, I've got this really lovely knife. Do you mind like while I'm here, can we put an edge on it? And it's a piece of packet packy mascus. How many times has that happened? Every yeah, time. Enough. Or not yeah. every time. Yeah. So I'd been gifted a piece of Packy Mascus um, <laughs> in the form of a Bowie knife. <laughs> and it, I'd had it for a while and it, I didn't understand enough. I, I was only vaguely acquainted with the idea of what carbon steels were about and what hardness and, and edge retention were all about. So I had this thing and it was a piece of shit, would you believe? And I took it to Keith's place thinking, oh, this is a, this is a no-brainer. I've got this <clears> knife that is dull. I'll take it to this bloke's place and we'll make a knife and then maybe you'll put an edge back on this because I can't seem to get one that'll hold up. And he was very, very cordial about it. 
considering what I know now and how much that would have just gotten right under his skin and burrowed up towards his brain. But <laughs> he very politely declined. He just said, look, I, I'm familiar with this style of knife and it's made in Pakistan. It was quite cheap, wasn't it? And I agreed with him that it probably was. I, I conceded it was a gift, but I probably knew that because of the group of friends that had given it to me, it probably wasn't of the highest echelon of knife making. And he politely declined to help me sharpen it. And then from then on, I was introduced to the world of steel's not just steel. <laughs> Damascus is not just Damascus. And from that <laughs> day on, that, that explains not. why Unky Keith walks around muttering under his breath so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I've done a few things to make Keith mutter under his breath, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Keith, uh, he doesn't just mutter under his breath. He tells me lots of things. <clears throat> what was yeah. the first? What was the first knife, or what knife did you make at Keith's? What style? It was a, like a drop point hunter. It was very in the theme of the knives he was making at the time. Then I know you guys all know Keith stylistically that you know his point comes down quite a bit, but it's a nice little sort of five or six inch blade. I've got a beautiful bit of miscellaneous eucalyptus handle. I don't know what gum it is. It's a red colour, but I wouldn't hazard to call it red gum. Um, it's Jarrah, yeah. mate. Yeah, it's Jarrah. They're it's all, Jarrah all the red wood. ones. All the red ones are Jarrah. Yeah. <laughs> Keith wood. would call it bean a tree. So it's bean a tree. <laughs> was a um, yeah, and it was so good. It was so fun because we, as I said, we'd gone in and we'd we'd forged out a blade, we'd filed in a bolster and done, you know, did a it was pretty in depth and it was a really nice time to spend some time with Keith kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we've been friends ever since really. I mean, it was probably another 12 months before I got out of my, I was still working again in electronics then. It was probably another 12 months before I got out of it, but that was one of the big stepping stones for me was, you know, doing a class like that and getting some confidence. And I think I'm not getting on my soapbox here with classes. And as I said, all I know all of you guys have, have run classes as well, but I firmly believe when I say this, not just for the gains that I might get as someone who does run classes, but it cuts so much time off your learning experience. Like if you want to get yeah. somewhere in this trade or in any place, going to someone that knows what they're doing and, and you know, taking some of their time and having a, a coordinated class that has structure is yeah. so much more beneficial than just dicking around for years and years and bro, possibly it's, never it's getting all, it. It's all free on YouTube, bro. It's all free on YouTube, bro. It, it, totally, mate. And yeah. look, we've all been to the University of YouTube. Somebody it's, wrote, I've been doing the, doing the Guild profiles and somebody wrote, I, I want to join the Guild because I want to be around people that actually know what they're doing and not people that yeah. uh, are filming their fifth night, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. And it's funny, like, Matt, because I'm kind of like you with that regard, because we're on we're on here weekly. You're our guest tonight, but we're on here weekly and we talk about classes. And I run classes and I've run classes for a long time. Yeah. And I've seen people come in and do a class that have touched on knife making. They come and do a class and they I teach what I know, I teach what I do. I don't shortcut it. And they walk yeah. away at the end of it with a new sort of view on it. But by fuck, I feel like a Kirby vacuum fucking salesman when I'm saying <laughs> do a class. Yeah. But it's the other side is, and I'm sure everyone's probably seen this in, in the comments that I post up on the various Facebook groups and whatnot as well, is like when people say, you know, oh, I'm in, well, I want to do make knives or whatever. And people say, do a class. And you see a, a list of people come up. But it's like, first question I ask, where are you? Yeah. And they go, oh, I'm in Sydney. And I go, Everly Works. Where are you? I'm in Brisbane. Go see Paul Aristan. Where are you? Near Canberra? Fuck, come see me. Yay. But, you know, we, it's funny. There's enough quality, and I'm, and I'm going to stress that term too, quality teachers or teaching places mm. to, to share it around. Like I'm, I'm busy, man. I'm booked out now. I had a few weeks where I had to cancel courses because of my back. But I'm mm. I'm booked as far as I need to be until February at this stage, and it's like there's no <laughs> fucking spoiling down. No, no. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's funny you said about the quality. In when I when I see those comments, when I see those posts about people looking for classes, 
I always tell them, where are you? And the second question is, if you want to take a class from someone, look at their work. Hmm. Yes. Because that's normally, I, yeah, that's I, normally, that's a good thing is because that's normally something that when we've had the shows and this year has been a real fuck up because we haven't had shows. And when yeah. we're at shows, the really cool thing, especially in the knife making community is I've had people approach me and go, oh, I hear you do courses. And I'm like, yeah, I do courses. And they're like, well, what do you teach? I go, look at my table. Yeah. And they're like, oh, and I go, well, this is the style of knives that I prefer to make. This is probably the direction I'm going to teach. And then, you know, the amount of times, Matt, you've been just around the corner and I go, you know, if you want to go and do, I, I definitely don't fucking try and promote knife making classes at your shop, but sure. <laughs> just just kidding. <laughs> but I say, if you want to do blacksmithing, go around and do it with Wayne Saunders or Matt, or if you want to make axes or something, Matt or Everly Work, uh, Matt or Mother Mountain or all that. And as Mert said, the one thing I say to him is, have a look at the guy's table and if you like what's on the table, do a class with that person because that's probably yeah. what the teacher. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's what they love doing as well. So, you know, if you if you ask oh, somebody man. to make some exotic thing, they're probably not going to be as passionate about it. But it's one of the things, like you said, I always ask what, what people want to learn and what sort of outcomes they want to get because there's, you know, Mert, your, for my eyes, a lot of the knives you make are really high-end kitchen knives. That's your background. You know, a lot of the stuff you make is that way inclined. Whereas Kev, you occupy a different place where you, a lot of your knives are, are those kind of bushcraft and, and yeah, outdoor tradi knives. The traditional, the traditional style hunter knives, hidden yeah. tang stuff. I and still that do the kitchen the knives, but... Yeah, oh, look, totally do. And I, I've, look, mate, I've... Uh, so uh, Bo Smith just put up a comment uh, for on this topic. Who would you recommend WA? Bruce Barnett. Yeah, yep. hands down. With, without yep. a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Barnett, simple. Go do a course with Bruce. He's yeah. a journeyman yeah. smith. He's a legend. <laughs> Fucking awesome workshop. Um, yeah. yeah, just do it with him. Do a Damascus yeah. knife making course. Might as well. Do a yeah. Damascus <laughs> clip joint. Anyway. Oh, do it, do it. Yeah, you know what, guys? We should... We should all three of us, we should go do like a folding knife course at Bruce and Bugger. Wait, the fuck out of oh, how many of you? Four. Yeah. Sorry, four. <laughs> four, four. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, four. That's what I thought you I said. Was like, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. Three, you, me, Matt, it's you, me, accent. and then I realized, let's just take corn as well. <laughs> right answer. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> So yeah, 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 no, Bruce, Bruce Barnett would be definitely to go over there. But Matty, um, yeah, your workshop there is uh, is something special, and really, you're not into the knives anymore per se. It's normally nowadays you're into this big forging sort of stuff. I, I guess is fair to say. Is that fair to say, or am I just pissing up the wrong tree? No, look, uh, yes and no. So I still really like making knives, but I really only would do it for myself at this stage. You know, we get, I get a lot of emails. And so most of the emails that, that I get about knife making, if they're looking for a class, we do as we just discussed. Um, but if they're looking for someone to make a knife, that's a harder decision. And I, I, I do yeah. pawn out every decision that I like. If, uh, as I said, if, if somebody came to me looking for a kitchen knife, there's a handful of guys I would send them to, or if someone came looking for a, a certain type of knife, I just think in my brain, who makes those knives the best? Because I'm not making knives for sale at all. Um, I'm not that good at it. And this this sort of touches back to the, the classes and the, the standard, I guess, that I would like to be setting in the shop that I run. But I don't take knife making classes because I don't feel like I'm of a level that I should be showing people how to make oh. knives. I, I can run through a knife better than 95% of the population because most of them have never touched, you know, a forge or a hammer or a linisher in their lives. But um you know the distance between where i feel like in my own confidence as a knife maker and where i would want to be if i was teaching that skill uh that's why i don't take the knife making classes at everly um blacksmithing is another matter that's what we do the most of we do uh, you know all about at the moment most of our commissions are architectural so we're doing a lot of kind of balustrading um we've got a set of gates on the go at the moment we're about to start a spiral staircase for a job that's the kind of thing that we're we're getting into now and that's the sort of thing that i really want to be into i love that larger scale stuff um but you know 
Oh, here we go. We've got Instagram happening in the background yeah. here. <clears throat> With um, yeah, here we go. Hey, your Instagram. Keep talking. Yeah, so that's kind of my ethos with the teaching, but also with the stuff that we're we're wanting to do project wise. Um, so there's James laying down in a in a boiler that we're riveting for a friend of ours, Rob, down at Southern Steam Services. I think Daryl Monster, some will know him as um, Daryl Milton, was down there that weekend with us. James and I and the, and Daryl were were helping Rob out. Piers is in the middle there. He's on a hiatus at the moment. He's gone over to um, he's moved into Alice Springs right before some of the dope. But um, yeah. he, he's, a, he's, he's a great blacksmith and a, great, a really great teacher. Um, they, they both are. Um, but, yeah, that, what you see, Piers is sort of on the big hammer at the moment there. I think he's pulling out some crowbars. We do a lot of industrial forging as well. So a lot of these pieces were, were jobs that we'd built up over that break period. We were trying I didn't to... re- I'd forgotten how shit that floor was around the seven. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. That's that's a bit deceptive. That's after the we'd ripped up the hot mix, and that was just the dirt around the floor uh, between yeah. the floors. So it wasn't it wasn't that shit. Yeah, right. Mm. So I'm the same as you in that regard with the courses, man. Because I quite often get people go, "Oh, can you do blacksmithing?" And I'm like, "Nah." <laughs> <laughs> even if I even if I came and did a course with you to learn how to make a hammer. And a pair of tongs. I still wouldn't teach it because it's not what I do. I'm a knife maker. And, and I'm, oh, I'm that's not, a big I'm, stretch. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, I make knives. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I make things that sometimes can get sharp, sharper than packing maskers at the very least. On a stretch. sometimes you can throw people sharp enough to throw people's feet. Hey, but no, I, I, I'm honest with that though. I get people saying, "Oh, can I do a blacksmith course with you?" And I'm like. Go to Sydney. <laughs> Go to yeah. Sydney and do it with the guy that does it. Yeah. Be, be in a workshop. That is... knife. They, people ask me, can you make me a hunting knife? I'm like, uh, this is this is my friend who makes hunting knives. Go see him. <laughs> Go talk to him. Yeah. I never hunt. Is... I never <laughs> held a fucking hunting knife. This Go is a 200. <laughs> no, it's like this is a 260 long hunting knife. <laughs> it looks very similar to a high performance chef. But it'll hunt. <laughs> but if you take a hunting, it's a hunting knife. It's a hunting knife. Yeah, that's it. Uh, all right, guys. Just uh, we're coming up for a quick word from our sponsor. So uh, Whoa. that means it's um. Guess what time minute. it is? Guess what time it is? Just let me just Timmy. figure out how to do this. It's Timmy time. Timmy time. Knife maker. Jimmy, what's going on? Gamaco Artisan Supplies. Knife Making Down Under Podcast. Bastards! Can you hear me? Hello? Anybody home? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hey. What the hell? Who got this ticket in? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? How did you do that all of a sudden? It's Timmy time, not Henny no. time. Henny. Oh. Timmy, not Henny. Lord, sorry, mate. <sighs> I can do oh. anything, mate. I just. Hijacked your whole team. Let me get the sun behind. There we go. That's ridiculous, Henning. Matt, you skinny bastard. Lucky you're good looking, <laughs> Henning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good day, everybody. What oh. you laughing about, Kevin, you bastard? <laughs> oh, and who's Henning. that guy in the corner? Oh, that's the real <laughs> thing. That guy. Henning. Where's Matt? Timmy? Matt's there. There's too many people. <laughs> it's too hard. Can you well, guys hear me okay? Go. Unfortunately, yeah. yes, we can. Yeah, We can hear you, but shut up for a minute because we need Timmy. To <laughs> that that was thing. pretty funny. You should have seen your face. You're like, where are you? Where are they? Where are you, bastards? Where are they? Tim. Timmy. Okay, Tim, yes. I'm going to shut up. Do your thing. Uh, thank you, Henry. Thank you. He's Is everyone going to Look at you. Look at you. Don't even thank you. Just get on with it. We don't have all day. Ah, uh, but we do. Look, we've got a Zito leaf blower behind me. We've got everything we need. 
What do we got today? What do we got today? <laughs> oh, geez. Can, can, can you spill the milk over your lips and down a little bit? Not at work. No, no, tomorrow. Jesus, I gotta wear this to work tomorrow. <laughs> You're not going home, man. Mate, why can't you see you? Oh, it's uh, freezing. He's, why can't we see Mert? He's on he South African Mert. broadband. Don't worry about Mert anyway. He normally <laughs> just doesn't come because he forgets. What do we have? <laughs> what do we have? What, we uh, have a what week's thing? wait. We have a week's wait on shipping. So don't ring us up and say, where's your order? Because there's fucking like three trays of orders that have to go before yours. Sorry, but it's just <laughs> right, isn't it? Well, Sheets of paper, guys. Sheets of paper. From from my perspective, I I took a trip up to Sydney to pick up some steel on Monday this week, or Tuesday or Wednesday, whichever day it was. Thanks for dropping in, dickhead. Ah, oh, well, you're too far out. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's because you're using bombing the hammer in your fucking head. But um, <laughs> now these these the Gamaco guys are like honestly they're fucking bullshit crazy. I looked at their pick and pack um, racks and I was just blown away. There was what what was there, Timmy? Three ton of G10. Yeah, we just got in three ton of G10. No, we just got in one shipment of three ton just after we got a shipment of one and a half ton. Yeah, so we got. So, Four and a half tons. Plenty, fucking of, plenty of G10 available. Oh, fucking G10. Did you do anything with them scaled? We got G10 Damascus. Oh, it's like... I haven't, oh, I haven't done it yet because it was only two days ago. Yeah, but that, that's true too. But you're just slow. Slacker. Oh, I yeah. am. Wait up. Timmy's <laughs> run off. Timmy's <laughs> run off. He wants to show us. I'm back, bitches. Okay. Look at this bitches. shit. Look at this shit. You can't even see it. Wet nah. it. Spit on it. Put some milk on lick it. it. Lick it. Spray some milk on it. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Now go. Look at the deep right on the skin. Oh, look. Lotion on its skin. Oh, look. Oh, look. Lotion on its skin. He's got skin milk. Like that. <laughs> get it closer, Timmy. Get it. I'll put you on I'll put you on big screen. Wait up. Surely I can oh, do wow. this. Yeah, let's like just that. get Timmy on his own. No. Wait, I'll get Timmy on big screen. Fail. There we go. No, no, no. Oh, wow. oh, look at that. Wicked. Milk and everything. G10 Damascus. Hold on. There's more. There's more. Let's get some more milk. It's just out. like heading steel, but slightly better. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously. It's had <laughs> oh no. Nice. It's got less floor. It's got it's less easier floor to get it better if you Yeah. There we go. Oh, put the lotion nice. on the skin. That's, oh, that's yeah. the nice one. That's hot. That's hot. Yeah, that's nice. hot. It's not on the website yet, but uh I took photos yeah, of it this be. morning. You've been there all afternoon up to 9 o'clock at night and you haven't got it on the website. What the fuck are you doing there? It's not booked in yet. None of that detent's actually booked in yet because MGL hasn't given us a freight quote, so we can't actually price it. But that's besides the point. So okay. there's all sorts of things going on. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, there's heaps of G10. You just can't buy it. Anyway, sucks to be used. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> like smog sitting on your mountain of G10. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. You can't have it. It's ours. Oh dear! All right, what else is news, Timmy? Fuck, I missed you guys. What else is new? Jesus, all sorts of new things. We've got some new kilns. Uh, they're the PMT range. They're for industrial use, but if you want to do axes or hammers or things like that, they're fantastic. Ooh. Sorry, guys. Do they get, do they get angry once a month? Hey, I better take it. Wait a minute. You bought the same day as the day, 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 mate. Um, you're live yeah. on. Uh, you're live oh, broadcasting around the world. How are you? Zero. Professionalism fucking yeah. zero. Uh, well, do you want to be live yeah. broadcasting all around the world? That's my question to you, son. Uh, Hi, son. No? Uh, that's okay. cool. See you, mate. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You ruined we... my bloody joke, mate. Because it's your what? fucking birthday. Well, he, was <laughs> talking about the, he was talking about the PMT kilns. I'm not saying do they get angry with you once a month? Yeah, well, of course they do. <laughs> oh, sh not be angry, Kevin. Also, got a KM45. There's only one left, but uh, it's, oh, that's um, the big kiln. That's the big, big, long one. It's 45 inches long. So if you want to do some swords Ooh. or anything. Ooh. What else? Got a heap of wood from KNG. Almost as long as the tension span. Hey, Tim, who's this fucker? You can't even click the link up the top. Glenno. He wants his grinder. 
Fuck. Are you probably going to get it pretty soon because we've just got a shipment of grinders in, and that's probably not true, actually. There's a lot of people waiting for grinders. There's a lot of anyway. people waiting for grinders. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but if it makes you feel any better, we just got the we just got July's orders out, so we're getting better. Anyway. <clears throat> How good are we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What else? All Where right. are we at? I'm going to go home now. Nothing? Got to go home? Yeah. Go home. Yeah, I'm going right, all right. So travel right. Timo. Yeah. Stay there, stay there, Henning. We'll, we'll we'll have you on in a little while. Just wait. I just gotta gotta give you his outro. Timmy, he's Timmy, he's a Timmy, what's going on? Gamaco Artisan Supplies. Knife Making Down Under podcast. And he's always having such a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Damn. That bearded bastard's still here. I can lose him if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, been happening, so anyway, Matty? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, good. it's good to see you I again, mate. Switch over to our impromptu guest over here. What's been happening well, over your way? Give, I us, see you, mate. give us a report. What's going on down here? Yeah. Oh, nothing. Same shit, just different day. It's just uh, summer's kicked yeah. off, so it's better. We got some rain this morning. Cool. And, uh, yeah, the guys are getting back together and we can have a couple of meetings for the knife guys. So it's, it's really the social part of the knife making is getting better again. Have you got the plague yet? Nah, mate, I haven't had it. I haven't had it. But I don't, I don't think believe has. in it. I think it's a fake. I think yeah, the leg is too smart not to good. fuck with Kahanning. <laughs> <laughs> the leg is like, yeah. I'm not going to fuck with this bearded motherfucker. <laughs> how are the restrictions, bro? Henning, how are the restrictions? Um, yeah, the, we've, we've gone down to our lowest level. It's level one at the moment. So the restrictions are pretty much lifted. Um. We've still got to wear masks when we go outside, and the kids' schooling is still screwed up. We've got to, I mean, my kids go, I've got to go to pick up and drop off kids three times a day. So it really ruins my work day. But other than that, yeah, that's, um, a, that's a fair big distraction. We can, yeah, we can buy a bit of booze at the moment. So that helps. Makes, it's good that you wear a mask, you know, like for, for the sake of the public that you have to put a mask, it's good. So they don't have to look at you. Say <laughs> 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 the ugliest fucker of the lot. <laughs> Did you notice though that Matt went off and turned his off screen and turned his light on to give you a better look at him? I did. I think there's something yeah, going yeah, on here. Good. There's there's a there's a, a remnants <laughs> of a loving relationship happening, I believe. Oh, look, no, you know, what happens at Blade knows, stays at Blade. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too, but nine months yeah. later. Anyway. <laughs> the first time I met Matt was at um, the Blade show last year, and for like half an hour of, of meeting him, I thought he was a crack in the wall, skinny bastard. Yeah. <laughs> and then you guys brought him over and said, hey, this is Matt. And I was like, fuck me, this is a human being. <laughs> well, everyone can look like a dumpling. Like a I think his dad made him a Friday morning before work. Like, <laughs> tell your dad you can drive in a nail with one shot, but at least sand the bastard when you're done, eh? Just give it a bit of a, a sand and <laughs> finish the job, man. Jeez. Look, mate, there's better one end than the other. I've always thought that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, goes, he goes to the kids' department and he buys his clothes there. And he's like, I'm looking for skinny jeans. And they're like, shit, sir, sorry, we don't know if we can help you. And then I'd, he buys I'd, a pair of jeans, takes them to his tailor and gets two pairs, mate. <laughs> I'd stand up and show you these stovepipes, but as I stated earlier, and you pants out, on. I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> Excellent, buddy. Excellent. Yeah, let the wind blow them around. That shit, that shit has to stay at Blade Show too, even though we're not at Blade Show. <laughs> Man, you I'm can't imagine my disappointment. We haven't had a we haven't had a show since Perth. 
Oh, yeah. And um, we yeah. haven't had a meet since Perth, and it's just getting to me. It's getting to me in the head. We've got to go and yeah. do oh, stuff. Same. You know? same. Uh, that social, yeah, that we'll... social aspect that Henning was just talking about. That social aspect, the meetups, the seeing face to face other people is mm. just kind of madness. And you know, I was saying before Henning, like where I, the, the little territory I'm in, you'd hardly know that there was anything. You know, it's small amount of restrictions imposed yeah. on numbers inside of buildings, but not much else. But then you got the guys like Dom Binkett down in Melbourne and the other guys in Melbourne, Victoria's closed down. They're on mm. savage restrictions. Help doesn't help their Mexicans, but <laughs> <laughs> No, not really. No. Not but really. It's, it's, for Australia it's very bizarre to have border closures, so it's mm. well the last time yeah, it happened was the Spanish flu. We sort of organized like impromptu get togethers, guys would just say, Hey, if you're around, come to my shop on Saturday. We're gonna be hammering some steel and grinding and just talking some shit. Because um the moment you start advertising it, you, you never know the cops might rock up and say, Hey, yeah, um yeah. what are you guys doing? So a lot of the stuff was just done impromptu. But we've got our first show now in the first week of December. Um, we've got the Brooklyn show. And it's, it's going to be good just to see everybody. Yeah, half your life. Yeah, that's my degree. I think it's one of those things too with, you know, knife making and blacksmithing. They're, they can be quite solitary activities a lot of the time. So, you you know, you particularly with knife making, you spend a lot of time at the grinder. You kind of got your hearing protection on and you zoned into a podcast or you're doing whatever you're doing. But it's, I think a lot of the guys that are into that kind of thing they really do miss the shows because that might be their their outlet. Other to, otherwise, the rest of the time they're sort of pretty solitary in their own sheds by themselves. And it's um, yeah, I think that's what's affecting a lot of people at the moment in our community. Yeah, and just, and given the number of shows we that we have, given the number of shows that we had planned in Australia, that's something that we're uh, someone like myself that's full time, always working for that between classes. It's making nice for yeah. the next show. Yeah. So that's your focus. Beauty, next show. Just got to get to the next show. And Mert, Mert and I know about you never slow down. You know, you've got enough stock that you keep pushing until the day before the show or the night before the show. Mm. And there's that drive. And then the release for that is you get to go and have some drinks with your mates. Yeah. Um, you know, see a whole lot of people that are interested in knives. Maybe make a little bit of money out of the whole thing if you're lucky. Yeah. But the whole big thing for me with shows has always been you know, my goal of a show is make my money back, catch up with all my mates. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. That's the best thing. Yeah, you can all social for. social gathering mm. that you can make extra money for it and you get to see your friends. That's that's what I'm really missing. Like the last time in Perth, I was kind of down because I was thinking, oh, I only sold this much. I wish I did more. But, man, I wish I cherished the time and I wish that we were – I wish I could appreciate the time that we were having because it was a fucking great time. We mm. were having dinners and we were bullshitting and drunk <laughs> a lot. <laughs> we all were. I, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you remembered that. I'm glad you remember that. We went but, to that whiskey. We went to that whiskey bar. But Corin, remember the best thing about the Perth show is the show was held at the hotel that we were staying at. So he had like See? a sm almost like a small <laughs> blade feeling like you were staying, yeah. you were in the city. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been yeah. down, as you know, and I put it on Facebook. It was pretty funny, actually. Um, I was I was pretty uh, pretty down last week. It just, you know, a few things were getting to me. Matty Mewburn come through and he said, mate, you look fucked. Come down to my workshop on the weekend. Let's rock and roll. Do some blacksmithing and get back into it. <laughs> So I came down and, you know, I wasn't really in the mood, but I went down there and I got into it and I had a fucking great day. And then the other day, like, uh, I just thought I'd better say thanks, you know. So I put a post up about how I was down a bit and then went to Matt's shop and I felt heaps better after it. And just thanks to all the boys that were there. Just that was – I I didn't think I was – um I didn't think I was really having a whinge or anything. Um, but then I got this uh, this comment. Uh, actually, it was a, a really um, interesting post for a whole bunch of reasons because it kind of went viral on the group. But I just like this response, and I'm just going to do a shout-out here to David Knee, who says, oh, yeah. oh, for fuck's sake, 
It's starting to sound like a woman's club. <laughs> I'm going to woman's club in here. Suck it up. Life sucks. You don't have it bad. There are babbled with cancer dying every day. There are kids sold to drug dealers as prostitutes at the age of eight and hang themselves at 12. So shut mm -hmm. the fuck up and stop crying like a bitch. Fucking weak ass men nowadays. Stop trying to get sympathy on Facebook and you make me sick. And if this is how it's getting on here and you don't like me, what I say, then kick Van, Van, kick me off, but just quit your crying, you spoiled little bitch. That's David <laughs> Kinney. Oh, mate. So I, I did kick him off. But <laughs> And he's a, serial, that... he's a serial pest. And I screenshotted that too because as soon as I saw it, I went, this fella's he is crying out for help. That to me, when I read that message, I'm like, this bloke hasn't he needs been a fucking hugged hug. as a kid. He wasn't yeah, hugged as a kid. You. I'm hearing you, Matty. He's been, he I'm was belted you. and wedgied by his family his whole life. <laughs> what came? <laughs> belted and <What>? wedgied. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but can I, that's for you, son. <laughs> So, so what got me was that it was one of those things where you post it up thinking it, it's not a big thing, but I'll just put it at the end that if anybody's feeling a bit bad, they want to reach out from there and, and the whole community's there because that's what the community's like. And I thought it was a pretty reasonable sort of a post, but there was so many positive comments. And what got me was the amount of people who inboxed me um, telling me their stories and, you know, mate, there's a lot of people out there with with issues and it's not – you know, when I looked it up with Timmy, and I wish Tim was still here, Timmy and I got on and, and had a look because we we're talking about what, what could actually be done to sort of improve things. And this fucking, um, we, we figured out that suicide is actually the biggest preventable killer of, I don't think we figured it out, we just looked at a graph, the biggest preventable <laughs> killer of uh, of men in Australia. So there you go. So yeah. I'm not saying I'm suicidal, I'm far from it. Um but I have down days and sometimes I have a lot of anxiety and I have a few issues. And I just found that comment of David Knee, just if anyone wanted the name, David K-N-I-E. <laughs> I found that comment really revealing. And, yeah, I'm with Maddie. I just think someone needs a cuddle. So if you know him, just go give out there, just reach out. Go give him, give go that, give him give a cuddle. That, give that fucking giant cabbage a cuddle. Go give him a wedgie. <laughs> <laughs> give him a wedgie and slap him. He just feel like when he was a kid. Idiot. You know what else I thought was really telling <laughs> about that post um, was the the amount of guys that you know they're they're quite tough guys, blacksmiths and knife makers. You know they're the sort of guys they they like spending time in the bush and they like yeah they're into knives, they're into that outdoors activity, and they're the sort of blokes that maybe they're a bit more stoic and they don't open up as much. And to see some of the names rolling through saying yeah fuck I've I've had a struggle or I've had times in my life where I definitely knew what that feels like um you know i think it shows that it's not it's not a weak person's thing it's a it's a really uh, it's a it's a difficult thing when you're in it but it's great to acknowledge that there's people out there that are that seem to be very strong that are still struggling even though they look like they're not yeah and yeah, back sure. man, i tell you you know and for me um one of the guys that contacted me told me a story and it just got me thinking as to where it started for me as well, and it was a similar sort of thing. And it was just, if I look back, it's um, it comes back to my uh, my father-in-law Vin when he committed suicide. And I, you know, I don't think I'll ever sort of forgive myself for not stopping. That. I don't think I will. And maybe I need to get some help with that. So, mm. you know, I, you know, it is what it is. I can't do anything about it, but maybe I should have. Where'd Henning go? He fucked up. He's, he's, he's not into this conversation. <laughs> he was getting a, he was getting a bit teary. Yeah, mate. Just as, think, as quickly think, as he arrived, I think, he's got. I think Timmy just kicked him off. Hey, how good was that? Just Timmy time, fucking Henning. Oh man, that was great. Fuck, that I pulled that off, didn't I? Yeah, Did you see him though? Where are you? Where are you? Yeah, <laughs> it was like it was like someone had led him into an empty room, and he's like, "Where am I, mate? Where are they?" <laughs> I did. So I, I didn't prep him. I've got a I've got a um, friend who's a doctor and um, like crazy career of stuff in the medicine industry, you know, in terms of being a paramedic and rescue paramedic and all the rest of them and stuff. And I was talking to him about, you know, conversation. Said oh, yeah, I've had problems with the back. I'm just working on the stoic Viking thing, and he sent me one line back, which made me have another think about things. Was even stoic people have plans. Yeah. So you've, 
you can think you're as thick skinned as ever and you know you're as tough as nails and stuff but you've still got to have a little bit of a plan on board but totally totally there we go anyway comments. back to the interview yeah back to the interview <laughs> um, so you're heading you bald bastard so he, you, <laughs> I, I don't know where he went. I didn't kick I'm him off. I'm pretty Just sure Henning, record, Henning, if you're listening, you fucked off yourself. It had nothing to do with me. Yeah, nothing. We didn't boot you, buddy. <laughs> uh, we actually like. No, we actually away. like. This is something Henning probably doesn't hear very often, but we like you, Henning. <laughs> <laughs> we only hey, tell him that when he's not here. <laughs> he'll pop in like yeah, any time. It's it's yeah. Kevin's personal thoughts. It doesn't represent the <laughs> values. Yeah. <in> the, those <laughs> thoughts expressed of mine and not podcast. those of other people on knife making <laughs> down on the podcast. The caveat hit, blah blah blah. Um, now we we've got a little drinking game going that some of the listeners created. We haven't oh, really good. pushed it too much at the moment, and it generally is to do with us mentioning things like Blade Show. Mm. So someone mm. out there is having a drink right now, but mm. what? What was your highlight of that being there? Like, for anyone that's oh. looking to go, <laughs> wait so, on. what was the highlights that you're allowed to talk about because of? I, I was going to say what happens. The Blade Show stays at Blade. Show. <laughs> there is a. Very... I know what the highlights were. <laughs> <laughs> so, Blade Show. Um, it was sharing was... a room with me, wasn't it? Not just you, mm. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Corin. I, I would. My first bit of advice to anyone that wants to go to Blade Show is don't book a table on your first Blade Show. That's no. that's advice that I got given, oh, yeah, and it was solid advice. Um, because I wasn't sober for the whole Blade Show weekend, and being able to sleep in the next day on top of the jet lag and the hangover made a huge, huge difference. Um, I think you're not ever going to be prepared for the magnitude of Blade Show, like to get around everything. Keith told me this when he when he was going over there four, three or four years ago. He's like, mate, you, you'll, you won't see every table. You'll go every sure. day that you can go and you won't see every table. Um, uh, mainly because you get there after lunch and fucking staying over still. <laughs> sorry, I'm not talking about me personally. I'm talking about everybody. <laughs> um, the exhibition hall, it's huge. It's giant. Yeah, well, the other one's littler. But the big one, <laughs> it's huge. Well, um, the, big, the, the little one's the size of Sydney Knife Show. And, but and you're right. The, like, main, the main one, I think the main one was like 10 full-size basketball courts or something. Oh, fit yes, into that totally. space like it was fucking monstrous or oh, maybe even more than that it was it's it's ridiculous it is. i will say it's a eight eight football fields man not not a damn best yeah so if you're probably but football fields more football so fields. yeah, Fuck, I yeah. Know. it's monstrous um i i think a lot of guys so the other thing the other piece of advice that i was given or the other little caveat i was given was most of the most of the real blade show happens in the pit in the <laughs> evenings <laughs> Um, around the bar, that's where all the wheeling and dealing is. That's where all the that's where all the the beautiful knives sort of come out and they're traded and bought and sold. And like that is a really cool. That's a bloody cool place to be. So going to blade shows, not I mean going to the show is great, but all of the fraternity yeah. around what happens after hours, that's the gold. Um, but it's funny because I remember coming out of the toilets, which after about nine p.m. in the pit. <laughs> Even though the toilets are hotel, they're not clean, so you just don't want to go there. <laughs> I remember coming out of the toilet and um, maybe Bubba Crouch was yeah. standing there. There's another guy, and then like Bubba saw me, he's like, "Come, give, come over and have a look at this knife." And they lift up this, open up this case, and there's this knife in there, and it's fucking mosaic Damascus with gold inlay, blah blah yeah. blah, fifteen thousand US. Yeah, <laughs> I was just like. Two steps out of the shitter. <laughs> oh, mate. Got a $15,000 night. Oh, man. Is the show broken up into areas so that specific interests have an area to concentrate? Yeah, it is. There's two rooms, and they both specialise on knives. Yeah, so there's no there's no chaos. <laughs> there's, all chaos. there's no order uh, at all. Yeah. And that's what – it's very I hard to get around. Sprinkled with some of those flipper knife shit things, like, you know, the kids yeah. with the – Yes, oh, the fidget yeah. spinners, <laughs> the balasong, the balasong. Yeah. The they fucking throw the knife in the air and 
lens yes. into people's fucking tables. Yes. Funny, and they, funny. I, you'd see them congregating in like in the public areas. There'd be a group of them, and it was like someone was about to have a break dancing competition. There'd be one <laughs> fellow in the middle, and he's flicking yeah, his little exactly balasongs right. around. That's how it yes, looked, and I think they were having dope, jewels. Dope, they were, and then they, they and, were doing beat. I'm pretty sure they were yeah. doing um, beatboxing with it, was it a bit as of well. Boxing. You're, you're yeah. right. It was very peculiar. The funny um, thing about it is, I don't know if you know Brian Nadu, Nadu right? He makes beautiful fucking uh, sharp by designs, his company. Fucking beautiful flippers and machine stuff. And I'm standing outside and all the emos around doing this thing, <laughs> right? And I'm just like, and Brian walks past me and goes, in America, we call them wankers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so do we, mate. So do we. Cheers, man. Thanks. Thanks. I was wondering. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny like you're talking about over there with um like the time difference and hangovers and stuff and even regardless of the fact that Australians probably do drink a little bit more than most of the US guys especially in strength of the beers and whatnot mm. we hit our peak there because that time zone difference <laughs> yes. when we start drinking at eight o'clock at night it's like 11 yep. o'clock in the morning back at home and we're like whoo day drinking Let's session rock on <laughs> so at, four o'clock in, at four o'clock in the morning when the hotel's flicking their lights on and off to get the australians <laughs> to go to bed that's quite funny <laughs> it's, um, it's a fair old party so yeah i'm looking forward to that one i, I really oh, am. Yeah, I look, if this is an american left you yeah. if it's uh, the, the problem with it is at the moment, obviously with this bloody flu shit and everything going on, is they're suggesting that we're not going to have international travel until after Blade Show next yeah. year. And that's like shit. Yeah, that's and then even thing. I think it's going to be prohibitively expensive to fly for a couple of years because Qantas have to make all the money the CEOs earning back. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, Cunt's got to eat, to man. Come on, Cunt's got to eat. I had to cancel Caviar. my 2021 <laughs> table. Oh. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen. So, We're Matt, get let's get back to talking about some shit in Australia that's mm. not related to Blade Show. Drink up, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Not you, Matt, the other Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Snape. <laughs> I haven't been holding back. Um, and, uh, and Owen, <laughs> drink up, boys. Um, inside of Everly Works, mm. what I kind of I think I know the answer to this, or maybe I don't. But what's your favourite piece of equipment that you get to use with inside? You know what? Everly I Works. Reckon, I reckon it's not what you think because yes, the seven hundred weight Massey power hammer is a magnificent beast. Um, Corin. Used it to great effect on the weekend where we'd. So I'll tell this story. Oh, I hope I don't no. embarrass you, mate. We're, no, that's all right. That's all right. I, we'd, I, we'd, I put my foot down we're like it was. Press, yeah. We're going to press so, talking about this, but you might as well tell the story because we'll get the truth in well, I'll tell. I'll tell this story and he can tell a bunch of the other stories. Don't give him a chance to say no. The two of us had had this. Corin had organized this big billet. It was about, what is it, four inches round or something? It was a fair. Fair size, anyway. size. Yeah. Yeah. big piece of cable. Um, and so we'd had it soaking in there and it was getting up to temp and everything was good. We pulled it out and we had the we had found these beautiful tapered swages that were just the right <clears> size. And we thought this is going to be great for anyone that doesn't know what a swage is. It's it can come in various shapes, but basically it's a top and a bottom tool that when they come together, they form a profile. So in this case, it was a round swage, but it was tapered from about 65 mil down to about 40 mil, whatever it was which was perfect because this stuff was about 60 mil round. So we've pulled this swage off off the the rack and Corin's wielding the swage and I've come out with the block and we've kind of gingerly fed it in because with this cable, you need to spin it the right direction so that it doesn't unwind on itself and you don't want to flog it because it'll just fray like a, a loose rope. Um, so we've tickled it down and we've consolidated and we've done everything we can and, and it looks it's come out at this beautiful 40 mil round bar and it looks beautiful so i've chucked it back in the fire and gone all right mate your turn uh we'll trade places you're you're driving now you know you're you're gonna operate the hammer so he yes. comes in and i uh, like you use this machine every day so you just get really <laughs> acquainted with it and i wasn't even watching what corin did next but i knew what was about to happen because the hammer takes a breath 
So when it's about to give a big hit, the front cylinder, because <laughs> the ram's coming up, you get the rear cylinder sucking down this great big intake of air and you know what's going to happen next. It's going to thrust it into the front cylinder and drive that fucking thing through the floor. Corin has jumped on it like it's his little nine kilo and he's gone <laughs> right. To, he's jumped on the treadle like it's no one's business. And this thing, I've just heard it. <gasps> big intake and I knew fuck this oh, is no. a big bang and then I turn around and this thing's about 12 mil thick and I looked over and I was like it's got to have ruined it it's got to and I, I've gone but I've it, gone here fix it fix it fix it fix it <laughs> oh, I was like we've spent so much time being gentle and tender and you've just flattened this fucking thing um, it lived. but it lived it yeah it, the weld was good it, there was a couple little d-lambs but it was it came out really no, nice and i think actually in the middle there's no d lamp the d lamps no, are all beautiful. at the ends and so i'll show you i just put up a picture of one of the ends um which is uh the one that you left in the acid overnight mm. <clears throat> but you'll see you'll see there clearly where the d lamps are but yeah. the further you go into the billet the less there are so you yeah, yeah. i just haven't That's chopped awesome. into it yet Let's just uh, do a bit of these ones like that. So what's really interesting here is the shape of the cable because the cables in the second and top layer, they're not square. They were no. this weird figure eight shape. And you can actually mm. see it. If you zoom in on that picture, you'll That's see that, those cables. And the other ones, it just it was just cool. It was just a cool piece of yeah. shit, really. Some it's serious engineering, hey. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. Some serious bit of engineering went into it, but yeah, I was so that was that was on the Saturday. That was a that was a really fun day. <laughs> yeah, and then we went out. To, we went and had Brazilians, and I'm not talking about the yeah. waxing kind either. We had Brazilian. <laughs> we had Brazilian food, mate. And yeah, they come out chicken hearts on a with, stick or something. It was. Yeah, it was. We did. We had yeah. chicken hearts. We had beef. We had all the food <clears> groups. <throat> we had I had the fish. meat sweats. And I don't know how you fitted as much as you did, and you just didn't say no to anything. I left right. there feeling like I was going to pass out from the meat sweats, and you just kept saying yes. I don't know how where it's it all like went. You're, you're fucking, you're six four, and you're like sixty five kilos, motherfucker. <laughs> 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 I just that's, keep, when he, gonna... that's when he's wet and wearing pants. <laughs> oh fucking hell! <laughs> that's what they do. It. That's Thanks, what they do. To, again, at Blade Show, the Texans take us out for steaks. And they buy yeah. these steaks that barely fit on the plate, and then yeah. you've got to eat the whole thing. And I, I think I thought, oh, this would be rude if I don't eat the whole thing because you know it costs like a lot of money. Yeah. And I've just like chowed in, eating it all, and he's just like, oh, this is too much food. I can't eat it. He's left <laughs> half it on the plate, and you're like, uh, didn't know that was that. an option. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's all good. Oh, well, that's true. Anyway. Yeah, yeah but so, but to answer your question, so the seven is great. Be but I do, because that's the go-to hammer, like James and I were on it today. I'll, I'll put a little video up later. Anyone that's, I'm going to do a little bit of whoring. Jump on the Instagrams tomorrow because I'll have a bunch of new videos of, we're doing some tenoning. So anyone that doesn't know what that is, we're building a, um, a ladder for, you know, like the old ladders they put in libraries that have got wheels and shit oh, and you yeah. swing them around. <laughs> so yeah. it's like a cellar ladder or pantry ladder or whatever you want to call it. So we're building one of those for a client and, um, so to make the rungs, the vertical rungs, we've got a piece of 20 mil bar, profiled it down, upset the ends. That was another beautiful face, Mert. Upset the ends. <laughs> and, um, and we set up a, or James set up a, a tool in the fly press where you, basically it pinches in with a really sharp angle. It's flat on one side and then an aggressive angle on the other. And butcher. what that does- The butcher. butcher. Exactly, an offset butchered tool. Um, <clears throat> so it's top and bottom and they meet in the middle and we use a fly press to do it. but it allows you to cut in really sharply on these these edges and draw out a spigot or draw out a thin bit of bar at the end of your thick bit of bar that then goes through your vertical uprights and you can rivet it back on itself. It's just a bit of traditional joinery that we do a sometimes. A bit of bar that goes through vertical uprights. That's right. So the vertical uprights are the ladder and then you've got the rungs oh, that are thick. I and was they... thinking along different lines. Keep going. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter, friend. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'll see that on the Instagram tomorrow. So I'm just I'm giving a bit of a whoring whorish plug for the Instagram. It's something good to check out. But weird little things like that, they're the things that I get really excited about. Like you know, fly presses. Unless you're someone like Jason Ellard or those sort of guys that live and die by the fly press, 
they're the sort of tool that I don't use that often. So when I see them used in new and interesting ways, I'm like, fuck, that's, you know, that's really something. And it, the same goes for machines. Um, so I just spent, well, James and I both spent a good couple of days cutting threads on this big Landis thread cutting machine. It's made in Cincinnati in the States. Um, that's where the company was. And it's just this thing, it's dual head. They're rotating it. Uh, we're cutting at 38 revs per minute, but it goes all the way up to about 200 revs per minute. But you can feed in bolts that you forged, rough forged. You haven't ground the scale off, none of that bullshit. And it, the, there's these four tangential dies that meet at 90 degrees in, in every 90 degree quadrant, and they just rip the scale off it. So you feed these, eye, we were making eye bolts in this case, but you don't, there's no prep, there's no bullshit. You just put a little bit of a chamfer on the front edge and you drive it A little it bit in. of lube. A little, a little bit, of bit of lube, a lot of good quality lube, in fact. Actually. Um, uh, actually. Um, <laughs> shout out to my friends at Lube Alloy that uh, based down in Queanbeyan. <laughs> they, they fixed me up with some fucking you lovely buy, lube. You buy them by a ton? I buy it by the 20 litre drum, yes. Um, Where are they in Queen? Are they in Ocean Queanbeyan? Is? Yeah, they're in Queanbeyan, but their mixing site is out in Harden. I don't know where they are in Queanbeyan, oh, I'm sorry. okay. Lube no, Alloy, great, great lubricants. Yeah. Anyway, that's by the by. Um. So it took me maybe an hour to set this machine up perfectly. You know, you've got to get all the dies the right distance and you've got to make sure that they're cutting in the right sequence and everything's got to be right. So the satisfaction of going through that process and then watching these dies just run through one after the other in an automated process, that is that really tickles me now. So it's, it's being able to get the, the machines that I don't use that often and really just kind of spend some time um, in them. That's what I really like. That's kind of cool. Having the access to those machines like that would be oh yeah, pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, nice. totally. Having access, but knowing knowing how to dial them in, set them up, and get them working properly would be the fucking really cool thing. And because they're they're fairly old, so there's like there's no one to ask. That's the thing. Like they're, you know, Daryl again, my, my good mate Daryl mm. Milton down at um, Yass Valley Steamforge. He's got one that he bought from Phil Johnson. The uh, dear friend of ours that passed a couple of years back, nearly two and a bit years back. But he has one and, and I was down there using his a couple of months ago. But outside of him, it's just reading manuals. There's nothing on YouTube. It's one of those things like blacksmithing, fuck. There's shit about blacksmithing all over YouTube nowadays. But you Google um, Landis cutting dies or Landis machine and there's nothing out there because they're just, they're rare machines and no one runs them anymore because of the CNC industry. So yeah, being able to, I, I guess it's just time, and I feel really great about that. That's one of the one of the things that I love about blacksmithing is keeping that legacy alive. But it extends out into these weird little areas where there'll be in fifty years' time there might only be a handful of guys that have ever run a Landis machine, and I'll I'll be able to help them out. I, I really I value that as a commodity. I really appreciate the fact that I've spent the time on that machine, and now I know it well enough that you know if if anyone needs a hand with it, I've if anyone's fucked it up, I've fucked it up before them. <laughs> that's it that's all yeah. that's what learning's about though isn't it <laughs> yep it make every mistake like that's you know we we had issues with lube the cuts weren't the cuts were welding and i was shearing stuff like it it just takes time to you go take the problem too sudden weren't you <laughs> sorry mate <laughs> too what fast not fast? enough lube <laughs> yeah <laughs> you got it Matt. Anyway, so yeah, that's what that's the they're the sort of weird things that I love in the workshop. Yeah, yeah that's no, that's the awesome. things you like in the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Who have you had? Um, I guess just out of curiosity, have you had any sort of celebrity visitors to the to the workshop? I feel like this is a loaded question, Kev, but I'm really glad for you to ask it. Um, <laughs> it's not loaded fries, mate. Come on. <laughs> um, definitely probably my favourite visitor to the workshop came in about um, 18 months ago. We had Lana Del Rey come in and shoot a, a music video or a short music clip in there for her, what was the new album at the time, Norman fucking Rockwell. And I, my, I just fell in love a little bit. You know, I, <laughs> you felt I did, tingle, did you? and I had, do you know how much hate I got over that actually? Because the next day when I put a photo of her and I up on Facebook, it was the first selfie I'd ever taken. And I thought this is a worthy, like I, I've never, I'm not real big on social media. I, I sort of do what I do for the business because 
like I, I, I generally like sharing the shit that I'm doing, but it's I hopefully not in a real contrived way. I'm not the sort of person that likes to sit down every other day and just make a post for the sake of making a post. Um, no, we got and so I'd never. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd never taken a selfie, and then you know, having Lana Del Rey in the shop, I thought this is a worthy reason to take a selfie. So here I am, and I had this dirty, great big beard because we were working at the time. I remember we had. Um, a great Italian blacksmith and his son, Roberto and Nico Giordani had come in and they oh, were, yeah. we were building the, the shark sculpture that we did two or, mm-hmm. two or so years ago. And um, so we'd started at like seven o'clock in the morning and we'd been doing long days back to back just to get this monstrous shark built. It was like four meters tall. And um, these two guys had no business in a blacksmith shop were knocking on the door. You know, you, they were suits. You could see it a mile away. They, they weren't there out of the curiosity of the trade. And I was like, oh, fuck. I don't really have time to deal with suits right now. Up what... with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly how I felt, right? Um, they were completely out of place in this setting. Mm. And, but they persisted. Like they just hovered around the door waiting for someone to come and find them. So I went, I walked over and I said, look, what are you doing? What are you doing? And at the same time, I kind of glanced down and I could say they had, they had AAA all access, access all area passes for Lana Del Rey around their neck. And they were real cagey. They just they said, "Look, we've got a talent talent in town, and she's looking to shoot some content. What would it cost us to come in here tonight? Because she's only in town tonight, and then she's flying to Brisbane." And they did, wouldn't tell me who it was, but I mean, Stevie Wonder could see that they had the Lana Del Rey passes on, so I'm like, "It's got to be her." Um, so we we bartered on a price, and as I said, I'd started at seven that morning, so I really didn't want to stay back that late. And she didn't end up getting there till 11 p.m. Um, but the next, so she started, She was there from, it was 11, <laughs> it was 11 until 2 a.m. that she was there for that three-hour stretch. And she what, had some What was the dances. song? What was the song she recorded? Um, Happiness is a Butterfly. Hit me on the grinders. Happiness is a Butterfly. One of my favorite songs <laughs> off that album, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Um <laughs> real bare bones crew. There was a couple of security guys, a couple of backup dancers, her and a couple of camera crew, like real bare bones. And um, <clears throat> because of that, it was really cool because in, when the camera guys were setting up the next shoot or whatever they were doing, there was actually some time to to have a yarn and just, you know, she talked, we talked about blacksmithing. We talked about what we were building and she talked about her tour and what she was up to. And like, it was, you know, a bit more of a connection than just that, that connection. flippant kind of, Anyway, whatever. So uh, that was that was a pretty cool guest to have. But like I said, I copped a lot of shit over it because the next day when I put the photos up of her and I, and I looked like I was, I looked like I'd been drugged through the ringer because we'd been forging all day. Had a big beard on. I looked like a real shithead. The photos again on my Instagram if you want to go and have a look. But <clears throat> everyone's chimed in. Thanks for the invite, dickhead. Oh, Lana Del Rey was at the <laughs> shop. Thanks for letting me know, dickhead. And I'm like, what did you want me to do? Like, I can't just have 50 blacksmiths show up to gawk at this beautiful pop star. Like, what was I, what was I going to do in the moment? <clears throat> Share but, the wealth, son. Share the wealth. You let everyone down. <laughs> you, better, just, you can try and justify it all you like, but and you know, I, I didn't even – look, i got to say, I didn't even know who she was until just now, and I'm just trying to find uh, the music video of which you speak, and I can't. So it's, it's just saddening me all over. So, Matt, Matt honestly, when they said – so when they walked up to the door and said, we've got a, we've got a star in knows. town and we've only got a few hours, Matt was sitting there puffing his chest out going, oh, so my <laughs> reputation has got out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. It, look, Get on enough. A... Four hours will cut it. Maybe we need five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. It was a, it was a pretty great time. We, I think back to that time when you had that dirty fucking beard. You looked like a fucking feral. You looked like a eighteen eighties <laughs> fucking gold miner that hadn't showered for fucking three years. I felt like jeans too. on your top every night. But yeah, that's funny. There you go. I was thinking that, like, that, in hindsight, that was not a loaded. That, that wasn't a loaded question, by the way, because I had completely forgot about that um, occurrence with that lady. Well, look, and you know, more industry related. We've we've been really lucky to have some incredibly gifted smiths and knife makers come in. You know, there's uh, when Kyle 
was here. You know, he dropped in with his brother and they <laughs> shot some shot some funny content. You know, with Bill did a class there. Bill Burke, mate of all of ours, did a class there. Um, oh, I'd be nearly two years ago, I guess. Um, like I said, Roberto came out and built this beautiful sculpture. We, we've been very lucky to share the space with some. Oh, Alex Steele came out uh, nearly four yep. about four years ago. Well, and we've um, had one of the guests on here, um, Michael Cthulhu. Yes, Michael was in there. It's that that that's... fucking sword class. That fucking <laughs> sword class of Michael Cthulhu. So that was chaos incarnate. We spent, I think it was three days. There was two classes and they were like two or three days each. I can't remember. But <clears throat> everyone had these mad ideas for these fucking giant axes and swords they were going to build. Like the sausage man built this big double-sided axe that I saw him wielding the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using it. That was absolute mm. chaos, that's that thing. And at the end of it, we went out to the annex and smashed up pallets, and everyone had to go wrecking this tim wrecking a timber pallet each. And I reckon some of these swords might have been like 30 kilos a piece. They were monsters. Yeah. Um it was my favorite, absolute chaos. My favorite thing about that whole thing, my favorite thing was Michael Cthulhu talking about the tin snips. Everything else has gone into oblivion. <laughs> Yeah. Do you guys remember that? Tell the story, guys. He, he almost cut his balls off with the tin snips. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. So he's got, he's leaning on the tin snips, cutting stuff like two mil thick steel. He can't get it to cut. He's leant right over it with all his weight and he's nuts in between the handles <laughs> when it let go. That's, that's <laughs> crushed nuts. I still fucking, that's all I remember. Not I just couldn't get that out of my head. Oh, mate. So, Need, need to do a little bit of a shout out behind the scenes on all of that uh, Michael Cthulhu stuff as well to Riley Burns because I think he put a fair yeah. amount of work in behind oh, the scenes. Yeah, he's the work. Up and running. work. Oh, and yeah, a little bit. A little bit is an understatement. That's that's playing it down a lot. But man, yeah. that was just a really really cool thing. And that he was quite a humble fella. And when he had when we had him on the podcast, was, yeah. fuck, he was he, he's funny. He's it's just, very very funny. He switched on, and if nothing else, as I've always said, it's it's probably just the Irish accent. I've I've talked to Irish people in a serious conversation. I just want to laugh at them and point yeah. at them. Yeah, it's just it's very about. hard. <laughs> yeah. So we've had no, a couple of people, and we've got we've got Brad Stone's comment up on the um, thing now, saying just just would like to go to the symposium. Never been keen as mustard. Um, yeah. With with the changes at Everly, obviously, being the Knife Art Association, a couple of us on board here, um, how's Everly looking as a potential um, venue in the future, mate? Look, we'd love to have it back. It's very different. So Thawa, obviously, being the, the venue for the last couple, it's completely different vibe. And I know people love the camping, and I can – I. I resonate that as well. You know, I, I missed the last symposium because we had, I can't remember, there was something else on that weekend, but it was, um, it is really lovely to get together and sort of have a, have a fire and, and, and camp out. Everly's not like that. You know, we're in the center of Sydney. It's, it's Redfern. We're right next to the train station. Public transport's great, but a lot of the guys are coming from out of town. So they've got cars and stuff like that. Um, but the good thing about it is, so outside of the shop, we've obviously got, you know, there's a monstrous amount of room. Oh, there's the shark that we built when Lana Del Rey was in town. Um, the the shop, the shops, are, it's huge, and there's not enough. You know, there's there's not a lot of worry for space there. But the other good thing is, um, they're cutting back on some of the office space and giving back some community areas at South Everly at the moment. So that's part of the development. Oh yeah. Awesome. So so we'll be able to. There'll be sort of classrooms and, and opportunities for learning areas that are not on the shop floor so they can be a bit quieter, a bit removed from the live demos. Um, yeah. So that's a big change probably from what we had last time. I know last time you know, most of the stuff happened on the shop floor and you're competing for, for attention there. But, yeah, the, the new development will bring all of these new areas online that are community spaces and they're kind of – they're pivoting around that heritage interpretation and – you know, being able to to do some learning in there. So, yeah, I, I, I think that we can definitely – I think what I'd love to see, and this is something a lot of guys have talked about in the past, but 
I think where Everly would really come to a strength is when we get to a position where we can run symposiums that are a bit uh, that are a bit more hands on. You know, we've got a lot of facilities and a lot of equipment, um, whereas a lot of guys don't for that kind of thing. And if yeah. if we were running a symposium with a smaller number of people, but it had a hands on um, a facet to it, <clears throat> that would be where we'd come into our own because we've yeah, oh, and, shit, and the I, thing, there might be twenty oh, anvils there. The whole thing with the the way symposiums are run and where they're run is just that evolution. Mm. And, you know, yeah. look, Seth Bar was a great location. We can fit a lot of people. Yeah. They've got a number of rooms available for people to go in. But yep. the feed, some of the feedback we get is, you know, why, why not elsewhere? So not just yourself. Mm. We're looking Queensland, Victoria. Uh, I think Adam Parker's potential sort of workshop build down there could be a yeah. future venue for it. But I think, again, in terms of not even COVID-related, but it was something that we talked about uh, through the Knife Art Association was the hammer-ins over in America are smaller groups of people mm. with a lot more content and a lot more sort of that personal um, yeah. vibe. So, um, yeah, no, that's good. I just sort of – that was just one of my – piqued my curiosity things – with your development and what they were doing with it. Because, Kyron, you were pretty vocal on that Save Everly um, group that went up ages ago when the the development was coming into play with that or potential development, potential loss of the workshops and stuff. So it'd be really nice to get back into that. And, you know, camping camping's really cool and all that sort of stuff, but I've got to admit um, that 750-metre walk around the corner of that pretty awesome <laughs> pub that's yeah. also pretty inviting too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the area around that is actually turning, you know, it's it's coming a lot nicer. Yeah. Um, there's a lot lot of lot of potential sort of places around to hire, you know, a room off Airbnb or whatever. But no, that's yep. good. Yeah, no, we we'd love that. And I think <clears throat> like you said, like I know you went to was it Rick Dunkley's place you went you went up to and they yeah. I know they did yep. a, a, a folder course and they you know, getting well, that, half a dozen yeah, that was or a dozen. Just, that was just a group of us. That was actually yeah. a little impromptu thing when we did that course with Rick. Was it? But then that tacked on to having the hammer in at his place, um, which was just unreal. Like, was there a dozen, about, I think there was a dozen presenters, um, which I don't think any were less than a master smith. No. Yeah. And then you had um, Veronique and... Um, Co over there as well because they came up after Blade Show mm. and it was just mind boggling. And out of that, I think yeah. we had 30 or 40, 30 or 40 people and it, and it worked. And I've seen similar with um, Neil's over in South Africa with the way that they run their stuff. They have 40 people in there with the big um, screen and they'll have a demonstration on there. So you've got everyone in that yep. one demo. And I don't think anyone sits there and goes, Oh, I wish I was around the corner. You know, listening to fucking Kev talk or or whatever or Corin talk, they're all engaged in that one thing and yeah, you know, on the one food thing. For thought, yeah, food for thought in terms of what we can run in the future because you know, shit hits the fan now. Government don't get their shit together and they keep putting these restrictions on us. We're going to be looking at ways of dealing with smaller numbers in yeah. So, and I think you know, being that that's the bit that I think is is lacking at the moment, and that's the sort of stuff that I love to do is that the hands on stuff. If mm. if we could run smaller groups and maybe not conflicting groups, you know, instead of trying to have a couple of different presenters at a time, just ha you know, you could pretty yeah. comfortably have twenty guys at Everly all swinging a hammer at the same time, all okay. following the same <laughs> instruction, and you could have yeah. like, and the, that's where the the Americans are so lucky because they're they're spoilt for talent over there. There's a lot of, th there is that, there's a ton of yeah. master smiths, but most of them probably live there. You know, you can have 10 master smiths in the same room. Um, whereas we don't get that here, but I think it would be really lovely to be able to get that sort of thing happening. Um, and we've got the space for it. So I reckon yeah. we should. I reckon we can. Yeah. I reckon we can. Yeah. Not only should, I reckon we can too. KAA, uh, KAA's uh, AGMs this weekend. The yeah. same. Well, there'll be stuff being talked about. I know that much. Yep. Yeah. Very good. So we've gone for an hour and 45. Um, <laughs> and it, it's, time's gone well, man. Like that's, It just flies really by, doesn't it? 
It does. It's yeah. it's interesting shit. You it's interesting. We know about you and we've been around you for a long time. And I still find what you say interesting about the way things run. <laughs> and yet we've got all our listeners. Some of them might not have even ever heard of you before tonight. Yeah. Uh, now they know that you're like the human crack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what you get up to at Everly as well. And, and yeah. man, yeah, like it's fucking awesome. It's an awesome thing. So yeah, I've, thanks, got some, I've got some public service announcements. Um, one is uh, next week is a special interview again. We've got uh, we've got a big interview lined up for next week. I won't let too much out of the bag there. But the big one that's out of the bag is that um, Sean McIntyre is uh, is coming on in on the fifteenth of October to do a presentation awesome. on joining the guild. So he'll be taking the screen and giving his presentation for for an hour and a half or so. You'll be able to ask him questions. He's a master smith and a really great guy. Very cool. Ask um, serious questions. Don't don't ask dickhead questions. <laughs> yeah, serious questions. Dickhead, serious. dickhead will be um, eliminated from yeah. the fucking proceeding. Yeah, so yeah. good guy. Make a comment um, about the height. You fucking bend. <laughs> no cabbages. No, one, no one's gonna know on this medium. And now that you've just told them, <laughs> yeah. Fair warning. And, um, fair warning, Matt Snape. Uh, <laughs> after that. Oh yeah, we've got some. We've got a big one lined up where we're getting a big industry supporter company coming on. So that's oh, um, yeah, yeah. So I've been too much out of the bag with that one. That's going to be. A just stay tuned if you if you like the podcast. Uh, we've got some good information what's <clears> coming up. So yeah, and and Matt, thank you very much as 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 always, mate. I wasn't asleep there. Someone who said that I was actually chopping up a little pencil into pieces on my keyboard. I'm glad um, to be interesting to you. Seemed like very it, glad. It seemed, it did seem like a good idea at the time, but actually, <laughs> it, it's it's in my keyboard. Anyway, graphite is conducting. So that's uh, the yes. reason. As a as a stupid thing to end on, the reason that they invented the pen to go into space, that vacuum controlled pen, is if you use a pencil, you get graphite in your fucking electronics, and it shorts everything out, and it's bad news. So don't take uh, pencils into outer space. But the Russians just used a pencil. Yeah, but the pencils short circuited all their electronics and they lost a lot of they cosmonauts. Don't care. They don't they lost care. Cosmonauts, a lot of cosmonauts. The time it doesn't. Everybody wants to be a cosmonaut. You just get another one. Oh, that's anyway. what happened. You just, you just get a new one. <laughs> yeah. It's that's Russian. what NASA stands for, isn't it? Need another seven astronauts. Anyway. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, after Challenger in Columbia, well done. <laughs> I didn't make that up. That just, when we were kids, that seemed really yeah, funny. But, you know, as you get man. older, yeah. Anyway, that was um, enduring Columbia too. <laughs> it was the first one that went off with the teacher. Challenger, the, the late, yeah, that yeah. One. Challenger. Yeah, yeah, she up. learned a lesson, yeah. didn't she? Terrifying. <laughs> 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 You're on your own there, son. All right. Uh, anyway, space, we're, hit, front, we're yeah. hitting the mark, so I'm going to go to bed. Yes. You guys have a good one. I'm going to go to bed and. Um, I'll see you later. Good night, sweetheart. Right, thank you, good, man. It's time. Lovely to, to talk to you, blokes. Thanks for having me on. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> good to have you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Myrtle. Good to see you, bud. Sing us out, man. Come, man. Happy birthday, birthday Mr. To President. You. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday, Corin Khan. <laughs> Happy birthday. Birthday to you. Now, Matt, stand up and give him the Ooh. present. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh boys. Have a good one. Hey, Take care, on. everyone. Stay there. Yeah,